could find such a love at our age. Whoever thought we could dance on a thrill. Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I'm your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmers. Hello, Judy. Hello, viewers and listeners. Judy, let people know, what is our topic for today? Simple Sex Education and Connecting with Your Erotic Self, an interview with Sarah Watson. We just finished that interview. Mm -hmm. uh, really fun person to talk Very to. Very dynamic. And, and, and really knowledgeable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And fun stuff about, you know, how do you talk to kids right. about sex. Yeah. Uh, that came up as part of it. And uh -huh. she she's uh, had a bunch of stuff. I'll, I'll throw in something else. This may be a little teaser for some people, too. Uh, she also happens to be involved in a podcast about people, it originated for people who have bleeding disorders, right? And especially about menstruation and bleeding disorders. And then she said they broadened it to include all sorts of issues having to do with menstruation. So she had a lot to say about that as mm -hmm. well. So, so listen up, listen up, indeed. Let's put in uh, some plugs for our our favorite stuff. Okay. Okay. What do we start with today? Well, why don't we start about with. Uh... It's not about communication, why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong. Folks, if you have any interest in using couples therapy, you know, as a consumer yourself, if you're a therapist yourself, you'll certainly have interest in that. Mm -hmm. And just the general topic of how does this business work? Uh, and, you know, some provocative stuff about, yeah, what really doesn't work? I recommend that book highly. Mm -hmm. uh, and lots of people have told me that's what they get out of that one. Mm -hmm. And then we have... Reigniting the spark, uh, why stable relationships lose intimacy and how to get it back. And that's a book for you if you're in a relationship and maybe it's hurting and you want it, ways of feeling better. That will help you if you're in a relationship that's good, but you want to make it even better. That will help you if you're just interested in that stuff. That Absolutely. Will help you. So go for that. And I do want to mention before we get to our sponsor, I want to mention the book that I'm working on now. Mm -hmm which is the working title. It looks like it's going to end up being the title, I think, okay. is Betrayal, Forgiveness, and Faith. So it's a lot about betrayal and how you recover from betrayal, how you heal, how you heal and are even better off for having gone through it, which is a tall order to people who've just been betrayed, I'll tell wow. you, to feel yes. that way. But uh, I have a feeling from what lots of people have told me, it's going to be quite popular because there's a lot of folks when they're reeling from a betrayal yeah. are looking for something that will help them and that's the book that I'm writing. So if you have any uh, interest I will th I'll toss this out to our listeners. If okay. you have any interest in reading a pre-publication version in exchange for offering me helpful criticism Mm -hmm. uh, please get in touch, and I would be very happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, and also, be will be wanting once the book comes out. I'll be wanting people who will want to review it as well. So let's put in a word for our sponsor. Okay. Well, connecting with your erotic self. There we are. Here we are. The Blue Tent: Erotic Tales from the Bible. By so, by Laria Zilber. By Laria Zilber, who I have to confess to you, Judy. Yeah. I have a serious crush on. Oh. Yeah. Well, if you're going to have a crush on anybody, Laria is the one. Yes. Now you might, for the sake of letting people know, mm. you might mention another little factoid about Laria that might be relevant to my comment. I'm Laria. There we are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said in our last podcast, this is my only, the only um, closest I've, I've ever come to polyamory <laughs> is having my relationship with both you and Laria, uh -huh. uh, which I just find very exciting. So, mm -hmm. so there it there is. There you go. Yes, indeed. So do, do check that out. You can get that, The Blue Tent, in any of your favorite formats, including the audio book, which Judy did the... And I think we credited it as, as you. I think it's, it's so. Laria, yes, you. Laria wrote the book, but Judy did the, uh, did did the audio. And you do your audio for and your audio books. for mine as well. And, uh, and we've been told yeah. we have lovely voices. We have been told that. <laughs> that is true. So let us get on with our interview, and we'll see you on the other side. Our guest today is Sarah Watson. Sarah is a licensed professional counselor and certified sex therapist. In her therapy practice, she helps her clients unpack their ideas about sex, self, and relationships, and reconnect with their erotic selves. Sarah is also the founder of Simple Sex Education, where she helps parents have age-appropriate conversations about sex with their children. 
when she's not helping women tune into their erotic selves or helping parents talk to their children about sex, Sarah spends time with her family in Northern Michigan. Sarah, welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Our pleasure. We are delighted to have you. So we always like to start off with our guests by asking, tell us how you got into the work you do. Tell us something about your own journey. Yeah, it's uh, it's always the it's a great question, right? Like how did how did a therapist become a therapist? Exactly. I come <laughs> I come from a long line of educators. Oh. Um, so yeah, my so aunt, do we, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Wrong. All right. See again, right <laughs> yeah. there it goes. Right. Um, both of my parents were educators at a point. My aunt and uncle were educators. Um, and my aunt was a therapist, and so kind of saw her go through the um, process of going from education into school counseling and being like, oh, that's really interesting. And I also come from a grandmother with severe mental health issues. And we were always talking about therapy. It was just something that happened in my childhood um, in the 80s. I'm 40, I'm going to be 42 this year. And it was just something that my parents openly talked about that my grandmother was in therapy. And one day she said to me, you know, you really, you really should do art therapy. And I was like, oh, what's that, Grams? Like, what's, what does that even mean? She's like, oh, well, I did it. And she would explain to me like what she experienced. And so my background for therapy, my specialization is actually um, started with art therapy. So I started there and then, yeah, which was amazing. So it was, you know, I was impressed upon me that therapy is helpful. I could see a shift with my grandmother at times. Um, she had a dissociative identity disorder. So it, oh, it was, wow. yeah. So it was a really interesting childhood to see, but therapy was always something open. And we knew that Graham went to therapy and art therapy was helpful. And then my aunt was a therapist and the educators taking care of, you know, kids mm -hmm. and how special that was. So that was kind of the the road that led me there. And then I got fired from an art therapy job <laughs> <laughs> to be really frank. Um, and, and I asked, uh, uh, one of my best girlfriends for help and I knew her mom was a social worker in the area. And she's like, Oh, my mom wants to have lunch with you. Come over, like, come hang out with her. And then we'll, we'll go do our own thing. Two hours later, um, not realizing that her mom was the person who started the sexual health program at University of Michigan oh. <laughs> and had said, Sarah, if you want to go into practice and you want to work with couples, you really need to, you really need to focus on sexual health. And I was like, oh, yeah, all of this makes sense. Like she was taking all of these puzzle pieces for me and put mm -hmm. them together. Yeah. And, and so you, you expressed an interest in working with couples? I that did. Was, yeah. Yeah. I was like, Hey, I want to go into private practice. Like I really, I'm ready to get back into that. Um, I did that before out of graduate school and I was like, I really want to do that. Like art therapy, you can't bill for it here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something where I could make a sustainable living. Um, mm -hmm. so she kind of helped me out and changed my life. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, neat. And what, you know, what, what drew you especially to couples therapy and then you know, and of course, as you point out, if you're going to do couples therapy, you better learn about sex therapy and sex, you know, topics about sexual health. But I'm curious, you know, how did that happen? I've always been interested in the dynamics of couples. Uh, I come from, my parents were divorced when I was 15. So obviously a very tender age watching that happen. Mm. Um, my uh, other extended family members have gone through marriage issues. So I've always been something, I am the oldest in the family. So I am, I am listening. I was the little kid under the table listening to all of the things and have always just known I'm really interested in that. And then it, it happened kind of naturally. Our friends would talk to me about their relationship. And mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, have you thought about this? And what do you think about this? And how, you know, what about him and, and this and that? And it was a natural just curiosity. And um, then just having exposure, a few exposures to it right out of grad school. I mean, like, oh, this is, this is fun. Like, mm -hmm. look, we could talk, you guys can talk, we can figure this out. And it's like a little, it's a fun, it's a fun way to communicate with other people and to help them. Um, so that's really, it was just, I really liked it and was really interested in it. Mm -hmm. And then how did you make the leap from couples therapy to sex therapy? Well, they go hand in hand. So mm -hmm. it was, it was the training at Michigan and making sure that immediately 
um, through supervision, obviously, of course, and doing all of extra trainings and things like that, that I was focused on and doing couples, you have to have a certain amount of couples hours to be certified as a sex therapist. And naturally it just happened. And then word started to spread, um, throughout the community, thankfully that people were benefiting, uh, couples were benefiting from our sessions and, mm -hmm. and they just keep coming. And we just keep talking about that and sex. And I think there's a lot of people who don't talk about sexual health. A lot mm -hmm. of clinicians, do not know how to navigate that with a couple in the room. You know, um, I, I've, I think I've told this little anecdote before, but I was at a training a year or two ago sure. uh, and it was, uh, you know, it was on Zoom. It was like 150, 200 um, people who are interested in couples therapy because it was a training about couples therapy. Yes. And the trainer sent out a little poll and asked, well, how many of you ask people about their sex lives, mm -hmm. you know, in the first or second session early on? And I'm sitting there thinking, well, of course, obviously people are going to do that. And yeah. it was about 30%, I think. It was yeah. way under half. Yeah. Many, many people were saying, oh, no, I wait till they bring that up. And I'm thinking, seriously? You yeah, don't like wait till they bring up all sorts of other things. And it, it's because <laughs> the therapists themselves don't know how to talk about sex. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so I immediately, well, obviously people know they're coming to a sex therapist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, um, I know everyone has their own format of doing things, but I always do a call before I even book anyone. Mm. Um, I'm doing that consult call because I want to make sure that I feel comfortable with the issue that they're bringing to the table mm -hmm. and that I have experience in doing that. Um, and if I don't, or it's outside of my knowledge, I'm mean, like, Hey, no, but I will find someone for you. That is like, we will, we will refer you out. Um, I always, always do that. And then I talk, we talk about sex immediately. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you, oh, that you don't have an orgasm, like you're having trouble orgasming. You're not having any sex, painful. Yeah, you know, there's so many, so many mm -hmm. things we cover right away. So mm -hmm. it's kind of the benefit of being the sex therapist. I can ask about it right away. Well, and they, they you do and have that's that. why they come to you. So. Yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they know they're going to get that question. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so we saw in, in your background material, <laughs> yes. you had mentioned you were raised in a conservative Midwestern family. How did that affect your um, upbringing and your thoughts about sex and how you approach the whole thing? Oh, my. I, what a loaded question. Um, but... <laughs> we got it from you. So <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So, yeah, I grew up in a very traditional Christian Baptist household until about the eighth grade. It was very much we went to church multiple times a week. Um, it was you must be air quote saved by Jesus so you can go to heaven. Kind of the fear of hell and doing wrong, um, very, very toxic in my mm -hmm. book, very, very mm -hmm. frightening. I think uh, some of my anxiety developed, I, 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 full, I talk about this on my own podcast and with all, with everyone, I have anxiety. And um, that definitely started in the beginning because of church. Mm -hmm. um, and then my parents divorced and the church kind of abandoned my family. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. And my parents were part of a, what we, I would call like a big box church now uh -huh. um, that started here in Michigan and they they disappeared. And uh -huh. then I went to a, another, I, I grew up in private school too, religious private school. So it was church uh -huh. and also private school. Uh -huh. So it was Christian school, Christian church. Then I went to a, just a very different private school and all of the other girls in middle school were Jewish. Ah. And so then I was exposed to, yeah, to, to this amazing world. That, that's where and, we come from. Is yes, yes, I, yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And my uncle who married my aunt is also Jewish. And so we had been doing Passover and now I'm at the school and it's like, it's all around and going to, to mitzvahs and like just experiencing the culture. I mean, like, wow, this is really different. And then I landed in Catholic school. Uh, <laughs> Go figure. Well, you've yeah, been yeah. around. I, so, <laughs> You're trying to hit all the bases. <laughs> yeah. So I got I got everything. Um, which, you know, in Catholicism, again, we are not, I didn't grow up Catholic, but going to Catholic school um between eighth and twelfth grade, uh, just a whole other ballgame of shame around sex. So very, mm -hmm. very similar to how I grew up as a child. Um, 
pleasure was never discussed. Sex wasn't talked about. You do not have sex before marriage. Um, definitely came from a place of shame. Uh, I don't, I ask my clients this all of the time, but I don't recall how my parents spoke to me about sex. Um, I think it was a book. I have a vague, mm. vague memory that it was like, I was sitting on my mother's hope chest and there was a book and that's it. Yeah. Like yeah. nothing else. So, um, organized religion definitely has influenced how I look at relationships and sexual mm -hmm. health and the lack of medical information that is involved with talking about sex is very alarming to me mm -hmm. growing up in those types of institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it greatly shaped my, my understanding of who I am as a sexual being. Mm. Which uh, also sounds like maybe we can segue into your interest in doing sex education. Mm, yeah. Like, so you've, you've become part of the solution. Having grown up with the problem, you've, you're trying to be part of the solution. It sounds like. Yes, absolutely. Um, it is all about, for me, I noticed this trend, right? That people would come in, they have no sex education for therapy and be like, okay, so we do that first, right? Like, so we have to start at the basics. Like if you don't understand how your body is functioning, mm -hmm. you're not going to know how to describe your desire and pleasure and anything else to your partner. Mm -hmm. So first we do that. And I, it was every person, like every person. And I was like, okay, this is, this is something. Okay. What can I do with this? Right. Like, mm -hmm. and then people, I would have friends asking like, well, oh my gosh, they're touching themselves. Will I change their diaper? Like, what do I do? And I was like, uh, it's totally normal. So <laughs> it's very typical. <laughs> so I created simple sex ed out of that to be able to go around and have a, frank and open discussion about how to prepare yourselves to have this conversation and get the, the medically accurate information mm. about sex and sexuality. And then what do you say to your children at what stages, right? Because uh, there are different yeah. things that are appropriate and things that are not. Um, and I think the alarming statistic that sits with me is that, you know, children are exposed to porn at age eight yeah, because yeah. of our cell phones. Mm -hmm. and, wow. and yeah, so yeah. people are like, oh, well, I don't need, I don't need to, to do that until they hit puberty. Oh no, mm -hmm. we need to be talking about consent and autonomy and, um, all sorts of things well before, you know, yeah. puberty. So how, how do you start that conversation with kids uh, or what do you, or, you know, if you're advising clients, they come to you, they say, I've got this five-year-old and I noticed uh -huh. he's sitting in front of the TV playing with himself. How do I talk to him about that? Yeah. So we, I'm going to, I'm going to use that example. I think that's, a, it's a great one because it's very normal and typical, right? It's to say, Hey bud, like, I know that feels really good. And that's amazing because your body is amazing, but that's something just so, you know, we do that in private. Like you can do that in the bathroom. You can do that in your bedroom, but we don't do that out and about with other people around. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. They just want the information about mm -hmm. what's happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. You don't need to sexualize that in any capacity because it just feels good for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Any yeah, little kid with their hand. Yeah. Any little kid with their hands down their pants, it feels good. Yeah. It's That's interesting how you put that. You, you don't need to sexualize it, you know, because and it's so interesting because the whole notion of anything in our culture that gets sexualized is is now so other. Yes. You know, it's, it's it's the difference between how we treat sex offenders versus other kinds of violent offenders. And I'm not trying to say that there shouldn't sure. be special considerations, but it's yes. it's fascinating how freaked out we are mm. over as soon as you introduce anything to do with sexuality into it, it's it's like nuts. Right. And yeah, particularly with respect to kids. Yes. That yeah, it is it we don't know how to deal with it in our culture. No. Right. And I think if you are that person who has never talked about it and you don't have that information about yourself and then your kid is like pleasuring themselves and then you're going to be like a deer in headlights going, oh, my yeah. gosh, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yep. And when most people will say if they were caught pleasuring them, caught, right? Mm -hmm. Pleasuring, yeah. air quote, quote, like if they were caught pleasuring themselves, then immediately when someone tells you no, when you're doing something like that, shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And here we're dropping a shame bomb on top of a five-year-old who's like, but it just feels good. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. They're equating that to a back rub, mm -hmm. right. Or to like a nice hug or snuggling. It just feels good. Yeah. 
it's not sexual. So I, my, that is also a really important goal for me is not to inflict shame upon anyone about whoever they are as a sexual being, as long as it's consensual, obviously. You know, I'm I'm thinking as you're describing this, this is a shameless plug for one of my own books, actually. Yeah, do it. Great. I I have a chapter (laughs) in my book, Reigniting the Spark called um, Sex, Good Sex and Sacred Sex. Yeah. And sex, would, which is just short for plain old sex, as I call sure. it, the the stuff you were talking about, I, I mentioned that in the book, that, that if for, even for plain old sex, you need a very basic understanding of anatomy and physiology, you know, yes. what's where and what does what. Yes. And, and there's so many folks, what you're talking about, you know, so many yes. folks, adults who, ed- educated, intelligent adults who simply don't know much about their own bodies or their partner's bodies or what, what's even possible. It's right. fascinating. I do have to say when, when my kids were in middle school and they were bringing, we're in Vermont, they, they have lots of sex education. Love Although it. There, it's, it's very mechanical, you know? Yeah. And they were bringing yes. home these charts, these diagrams with parts labeled that I'd never heard of. And I was ah, thinking, sure. it's possibly that I'm so old that those parts hadn't evolved yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Or it's possible that they've just got names for things I'd never heard of. But I was, and I thought I knew stuff. It was fascinating. Sure. They, I, I don't remember what some of those parts were labeled, but they were. They, they had to take tests on it, you know. It was Good. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Like yeah. I think <laughs> yeah, you're lucky yeah, your to be in Vermont. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, your kids didn't have it. I don't even remember them having it. Oh, they might okay. have had it, just didn't, didn't tell me. You. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. They had it. And we, we're, we're a second marriage. So our kids were pretty much. Growing okay. Up. Okay. We I was like, wait, go. I thought you too. Okay. Same kids. <laughs> yeah, different set of kids. Different, different set of, kids, set of right? children. I got we, it. We have five between it. us, but I have three and Judy has two. And so that's where got it. Okay. different experiences in middle school, different yeah. schools in Vermont, different too. schools. in Vermont. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. And I think you can also like, kind of look back. What I like to say about that is that the United States is there's only, and I, I should have looked this up before we hopped on, but I don't even think it's half of the states are required to provide medically accurate sex ed. Mm, Mm. Yeah. And all of them are required to share and teach on HIV and STI infections, but that's it. Right. So generally across this, in my experience, it's the fifth grade puberty class, right. And then the ninth grade and it's general, and obviously this might change, public and private schools, but ninth grade puberty, um, like health class. And it's generally the health teacher, not a sex educator Yep, yep. teaching about these things on a unit. And sometimes they are separating boys from girls. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, 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 no. You all need to understand how bodies are working. Like if your own body, and if you are partnered with the opposite sex, you you need to know. Right. Mm But, (laughs) but you know, I am not, you know, the governing body here to change that. Now, how do you feel about criminalizing sex and touching between teens? Because I think, I think we're doing a great disservice to our kids because number one, you know, they're going to, they're curious. Number two, you know, they're going to have sex. Right. So, (laughs) you know, how, I, I I'm having trouble even articulating this because well, like two should, 15 year olds, let's say yeah, two 15 yeah. year olds. I, they're curious. I, I think yeah. we should be teaching them where you can draw your, your boundaries rather than saying, don't, 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 don't. And you're going to go to jail and you're going to have a criminal sex record the rest of your life. So let me get your, uh, the opinion of a sex expert here. So yeah, uh, I <laughs> completely agree with you. I think, and you know, I think each state differs because I don't know you know, Mm -hmm. I live in Michigan and I'm pretty familiar here, but, um, that we should be teaching our teenagers that pleasure is wonderful. And that if you have a partner, whatever that looks like is if it's consensual, right. So it's enthusiastically consensual, enjoy it. This is what you have the opportunity to not get pregnant. Let's make sure we take care of Mm -hmm. that because no, I, you know, I firmly believe no 15 year old should be having a child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and let's explore and exploring is great. And it's how you get to know yourself. It's how you get to know your partnership. And then I agree. You absolutely have to set boundaries and what that looks like. And I'm not going to impose my values upon anyone else, but I think you should be exploring right within mm-hmm. and in a safe space. Um, yeah. It's so tricky because the, a lot of the intention, you know, the, the intention of, statutory rape laws Mm -hmm. the the intention of protecting you know the assumption being well if you're too young 
you mm -hmm. can't really give consent because it isn't going to be informed enough by your own experience. Right. And yet by drawing that bright line, mm -hmm. then they're, they're ruling out all kinds of exploration that people might do at any age. Right. So right. It's, it's yeah. a, yeah. I would never use fear as a tactic, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. All it does is impose shame mm -hmm. and the desire to do it more. Like how, yeah. let's think about the teenage brain. You, you tell them, no, they're like, how far can I go? Exactly. Right. So it's, it, it's just, it's backwards in my opinion. Um, obviously if there's a, a giant, I agree. Like if there's a giant age gap, like that's a whole mm -hmm. different story. But if we're yeah. talking about the same age or even with, you know, I, I would say I wouldn't go too far. I wouldn't be like, Oh, three years because there's well, just so much developmental. And then it's that's a, the trouble. Any, right. any arbitrary line you draw isn't going to work for a lot of folks. I remember, right. Oh, 20 years ago or so. I remember working with a, a 17 year old kid Mm -hmm. who had a 15 year old girlfriend sure. and was in, and of course the issue there is not so much about the state per se. It's about the 15 year old's parents, Yeah, oh, 15 year old girl's parents. If right. they freak, which in that case they did, mm -hmm. this kid got in serious trouble. Right. And yet if it, it, I actually had occasion to talk to both the 15 year old, I don't remember why I was doing that. I was doing family <laughs> therapy. So how I ended up talking <laughs> to both, but I did. Oh, I know. No, I did. Well, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I talked to the 15-year-old and the 17-year-old, and the 15-year-old was very mature. She was a yeah. very mature 15-year-old, and the 17-year-old was not particularly 17-year-oldish. Sure. You know, he was sure. more like 15, 16 himself. So sure. it there was nothing icky about it, and right. yet there was all this legal stuff that was happening. And I mean, the kid eventually, I think he had to go out of state for a little while. They, oh they made oh some gosh. agreements so he wouldn't have a criminal record, but he had to... He Do had some to treatment far away from her for a long time. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's it's a hard. It's a case by case. And if we can again teach them about their bodies and how things work, and that also goes back to the parents. Like, what were they talking to their kids about? Yeah, they probably weren't. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you also mentioned something else. A, a podcast you're on called Flow. Yeah. Yes. And I'm curious about that. If you feel like talking about it, would, yeah, would yeah. Sure. So I co-host, this is our third, the, the podcast has been around for four years. This will be our third, my third season co-hosting. Um, it is produced by Believe Limited, which is a production studio in LA. And it is owned by a person who has a bleeding disorder, which I also have. I have hemophilia. A. Oh. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know what that is, is I, the very simple definition is I don't have the right clotting factor in the clotting cascade to make my blood clot. So I, it takes me a very, 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 very long time to clot. And mm. so through this and knowing um, Patrick who owns the production studio, I, they asked me to come on. And so we've been talking about menstruation for women with a bleeding disorder. And that's where we started. And now we've expanded to anyone who menstruates um, mm -hmm. because it's such a big deal. And the stat, I, you know, we just were talking about this last time, but I think it's 70% of women are undiagnosed and they do have a bleeding disorder wow. because yeah, it's pretty wild that. I, I just want to make old statistician in me is kicking up. I just want to make sure I understood that number. You're not saying 70% of women have an undiagnosed bleeding disorder. You're saying 70% uh -huh. of women with a bleeding disorder aren't diagnosed. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. <laughs> yes. Good clarify clarification. That. Yeah. Cause it does yes. sound kind of funky. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what, what can happen is because most bleeding disorders are hereditary, we can look back, like I can look back multiple, multiple generations and know where it came from. Um, and I have many distant cousins all over the country. We're all from the same, you know, the of tree course, is, yes. I'm, I'm sitting here wondering if you're related to royalty because that's certainly- uh, You know, true. everyone <laughs> says that, probably not. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it is the royal disease, right? That's how mm -hmm. it is known. Um, but we- we have found right that if I had a very heavy cycle and my mom had a very a heavy cycle and my grandmother did, then mm -hmm. like, oh, it's just how the family bleeds. Oh, no, 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 no. Like, mm -hmm. it means you probably all have an issue with clotting and you just didn't know because wow. everyone in the family has normalized it. Mm -hmm. And so- yeah. So we get to talk about all sorts of things. We talk about menstrual products. We talk about how to advocate for yourself when you're at the ob -GYN, or if you go to see a hematologist. Um, we talk to pelvic floor PTs. We talk to different physicians. We just talk to ourselves about pop culture and, and menstruation. And 
Um, and obviously in the last couple of years, we've been talking a lot about the legislation on women's bodies and how that impacts uh, our community specifically because different things are used. Like, I, you know, I have an IUD. I'm very open about this. I have no menstrual cycle. Thank God. Oh, oh, wow. wow. It's lovely. Mm. Right. And we know people use birth control for that in our community. And there are other things to do that. But with the legislation going around, we're very, you know, it's very concerning that we don't have control mm -hmm. over our bodies. Yeah. So we talk yeah. about all sorts of things, menstruation and periods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and clearly, I mean, I would think that fits in also in your educating people about sex more generally. Oh, yes. When you're educating, you know, girls, well, girls and boys about yes. their bodies. Yeah, we talk about yeah, yeah. bodies, we mm -hmm. talk about sex, we talk about, you know, it's it's a really, it's a beautiful platform to talk about everything. Mm -hmm. um, but to be, hey, this is what ha I'm in fact doing a um, session at our annual meetings about just being really frank about, okay, if you have a menstrual, like if you're having a really hard period, what do you do to connect and have intimacy? Because mm -hmm. some women will bleed for, for two weeks straight mm -hmm. and then go into the hospital. Or like there's such a, it's an extreme condition. It can be a very extreme condition if you're not treated. Um, how do you navigate that? And then yeah. what if you have a partner who has a bleeding disorder? What does that look like? And how can you still have pleasure if maybe movement is restricted because of an uh, internal bleed? Wow. Yeah. Never thought about that. Yeah. It's it's fascinating. It yeah. is. <laughs> Now, do you ever go into schools? Are you, uh, do schools ever call you in to do sex ed or? I have not mm -hmm. gone down that path yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely on the radar. Uh, I prefer, I love a conference. Mm -hmm. I love a small group um, because I like all of my presentations are conversational. Like if you can't like, and not that I make people talk, right. But like, I want, like, if you have questions, let's talk about it. Right. Let's be very specific because most likely the somebody else in the room has the same question. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I like to work, but um, I, I'm open to it. And I've been, I've been told I should push it a little bit. So it, mm -hmm. it might be coming. <laughs> <laughs> and when you work with uh, folks, do you work like with telehealth or do you do that? That's how you do it. I do telehealth, but I actually this week on, on Monday, I'm back in the office. I, oh, wow. Yeah, we, I have a partner and she, she's also a sex therapist and we decided that it was time to get back into the office. Cause it's, as you know, it's very lonely at home. You know, there's no one, you know, across the hall. I mean, my dog is here and my husband's in the basement, but I can't talk to him about at, like, he's, we're very different fields. Um, but we decided it was time and we wanted to have a space where we could also do smaller groups and host events. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. So I, I just went back and it oh, was, well. Yeah, it was like the first day of school. Mm -hmm. uh, I was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and then I settled in. And I was like, this is great. So as I did. You, you, you had your trapper keeper with you. And right then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I did. I was like, and I brought my lunch. And I like, yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah, it's great. So, but I do telehealth from the office now. Wow. Yeah. So. I will, I will always offer that because mm -hmm. I think, you know, I have people in Michigan, like the, uh, the upper peninsula. So I have people up there, I have people all over, all over the state. So, sure. yeah. What are, what are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about sex when you, when couples come to you, what, what are some of the big things that you hear? Oh, you know, I think from, if particularly a, a woman is coming in that, that they believe they're broken. Mm -hmm. mm. Like, wait, why? why don't I want to have sex? I'm broken. Or, you know, they will say very explicit terms of like my, you know, my vagina is broken or, or what's going on. And so that is, that is something that is often said and it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, and when we pull back the layers, we know, obviously you're not broken, mm -hmm. that life is happening. You have lack of education. Maybe you're a new mom, you have lack of sleep and your partner's not helping you and your mental load is, four million pounds and you can't even fathom the idea of having any kind of physical touch other than taking care of your child, let alone giving yourself the space to explore with your partner. Um, so the, the women as broken is, is a, is a theme. I think this idea of spontaneous desire, 
right? That. Ah, yes, that's a classic. <laughs> yeah. It's a classic. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Right. It doesn't little... count if it isn't spontaneous no. desire. That's the of yeah. course not, yeah. right? Like if you don't look at me and want sex, you know, there's something <laughs> wrong with you. Yeah. Um, so that one, <laughs> that one's always really something that comes up, and I talk about it uh, every week. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you know, I have a, a few clients that come in with erectile issues. And mm -hmm. this idea that men have been told that it is an issue if you don't have an orgasm right away, or if you have trouble maintaining an erection, mm -hmm. um, when there are so many factors, both emotional and physical that can go into that. Mm -hmm. So I, I really love talking about that and helping clients work through and make sure, you know, go to the, go to your physician. Let's make sure everything's cool. Like mm -hmm. everything's right. good in working order. And now let's figure out yeah. what's the mental load for you? What's going on? What do you think about sex? What do you think about yourself? Mm -hmm. um, so those are some some big ones, I would say. Those are pretty consistent in my practice. Mm -hmm. um, I also see just couples for, for, you know, they're trying to navigate having kids, like whether it's fertility issues or, you know, postnatal issues. So I see a lot of women with pelvic floor issues. So that's always really interesting as well. Hmm. Well, how can people get in touch with you if they want to, you know, access what you do or learn more about you or maybe have you as a speaker or any yes. of that? Yes. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, you can reach me at simplesexeducation.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also am pretty active on Instagram and my handle there is SWSX therapy. And you can, you can find me there. I post pretty frequently there as well. Um, Instagram and Facebook and Meta have a little issue with spelling out sex. So that's yes, why they it's do. a funky they, handle. So. noted that, yes. Yeah, yes, they don't like it. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's where I'm most reachable. I also, sarahwatsonlpc.com for if you're mm -hmm. in Michigan, I can, I can chat with people there. Great. Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks so much for doing thanks this. Thanks so much. Oh thanks for Very having me. It was fun. Oh, good. I'm glad it was great to <laughs> chat with you both. Yeah, so on. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Sarah Watson. Uh, I know we did. We did indeed. Yeah, she was <laughs> We've really We've had a lot really of fun. fun guests on lately, so we I'm very have. happy. Yeah. Very happy. We've uh, really, yeah, met a lot of interesting people and learned a lot of new yeah, things. Yeah, and we, we, have a, we have a few lined up uh, yes, we coming do. in the next few weeks yes, as well. Yes, we do. I will note on that on that uh in that topic that if you listener uh would like to be on the show or like to suggest someone to be on the show please go to our website ctn7 that's the number seven ctn7.com and drop us a line you'll see there's a way to send us a message there and uh, suggest yourself suggest someone else suggest a topic mm -hmm. write us a question we haven't been doing those for for a while but if you have a particular question you think it would be neat for us to wrestle with a bit on the air as mm -hmm. part of this broadcast, possibly with one of our guests, possibly with just us. Yeah. Do that. Drop us a line because we always have fun when we uh, mm -hmm. are handling those as well. Yeah. Um, let, what else should we say? Buy our books. Buy our books. Buy our merch. <laughs> Buy our merch. Go to our ctn7.com. Yes, Judy's holding up one of our beautiful mugs. You can get those. You can get tote bags. You can get T-shirts. You can get all that stuff. Uh, so please do that. Oh, and subscribe to your newsletter. And yes, do subscribe to my newsletter. Dr. Chalmers' newsletter comes out about once a month, just has a lot of fun stuff in it. Um, among the things that I always put in are the podcast topics that we've done right. since the last newsletter. Uh, so yeah, feel free to do that. It's easy to do. When you go to ctn7.com, a little box shows up and you click on that and by golly, it'll give you a little sign up form. And so until next time, remember, be kind, don't panic, and have faith. Thank you.